Machst du, ne? Okay. Okay. Good evening. Good evening. Welcome to another D-Day event. Uh, my name is Andrea Bauer, and um, tonight we talk about new forms of collective living and modern tribalism. And um, yeah, why are we doing that? I think in the last years we heard a lot about co-living, co-housing, co-owning. Some people even used the term co-everything, like in a very holistic way, designing the village 3.0. And obviously there is a, a, a way of uh, that people are not satisfied in the way we are living today. Uh, there are many reasons actually. Um, for instance, some people say there is a, um, a problem in affordable housing, there's a lack in community, loneliness, uh, so there are a, a big diversity of reasons why people think about new forms of live together and also to govern ourselves. So, uh, and I think tonight we have a very nice and diverse, hello, hello, hello. We just recognize you all in black. Mm. That was not, that was, woo. Um, uh, yeah, so we have a very diverse, um, diverse projects actually here. And um, actually, uh, Jessie Kate from the embassy, she could not make it. Uh, she needed to stay in the US, but still we have very uh, highly uh, experienced round of social innovators here. Um, starting on my right side, Christoph Fahle, he is the co-founder of Beta House. Uh, they founded Beta House, it's a co-working space here in Berlin. Uh, they founded it in 2009. Uh, they were pioneers at that time. They are right now definitely very established in Europe as a network of co-working spaces. And Christoph is today concentrating on an, also on co-living, but more in the camp form. So Beta House camps. They had the first project this year al already. So um, more uh, immersive, uh, contemporary, uh, short-term experience of co-living. Then we have Taina Moreno here. Woo! Woo! Um, she is the managing director of Agora Collective. And uh, Agora Collective is also a co-working space here in Berlin. Um, and they have also a new project. It's Agora Rollberg. It's uh, actually, they are, they're creating a permanent place there for co-living, but more a sustainable conscious way of living this is what they want to establish there we want to we're gonna learn about that more in detail tonight and then we have bruno here on my left side Hello. bruno Haidt. and uh, he actually was involved in a lot of co-living projects in the last year all over the world actually and is running now a platform called rome and this is a network a global network uh, especially for digital nomads uh, co-living for digital nomads. So please give a warm welcome to our lovely round. Yeah, so Christoph, you're the first. <laughs> um, you, you were, uh, you were uh, very much in the beginning of co-working actually. And uh, I was wondering now, uh, when this term co-living is coming up, is it like the next like natural step? And uh, how do you see that? Especially because at the camps, you want to bring together co-living and co-working. And I was wondering, is it like the best of both worlds? Or is it just, a can it also be the, the trouble part? Yes. So when we started uh, Beta House in 2009, from the beginning on, people were always asking, why don't you have a place to stay on top and I was just like first of all I thought it's a big like hippie thing to all also live in the workplace all together and you know this I really appreciated this the when we built beta house um, that we have a clear distinction between work and then going home I still kind of believed in this and then for myself I was happy that I could go home after long hours of startup life um, but I also never looked at it um, from a professional point of view. Always, I was sort of uh, communes and um, really sharing everything. And I just realized that when I stayed in Rome, uh, that this can also be a really uh, f good service. And it can be just very, um, on one hand, uh, you have a very clear, defined space where you live. And yeah. then you can have uh, a nice community area where you can share and, and, and get to know people. 
And so I just I say I I changed my mind about it. I d when I started co-working, we I really didn't see co-living as something that would be mainstream. But now I realize um, that all our apartments that we live in are kind of broken because we don't know very well our neighbors sometimes, and we are living isolated. And I really I realized that maybe people start to uh, believe or uh, start to look at it like that, and they want more community also at home. And the short-term version, why did you choose that with the camp? Oh, the, the camp. Yeah. Um, uh, to be honest, yeah. you know, I thought, I, I looked at my employees and they worked really hard and I thought, what could we do inside Beta House that is f fun for them? They could go on holiday but still would be justifiable f in front of my co-founders. <laughs> 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 okay. <laughs> but I realized it's much more, actually. But, uh, but I maybe yeah. later on. <laughs> later on. Um, Taina. There, there, um, Agora Rollfeld, it's, it's made it more, it's designed for a permanent space actually. And I was, um, so how I read about it, or how we talked about it, it's more about really to establish a more sustainable and more conscious lifestyle actually. And I was wondering because we talked just about, uh, you know, the system theory, and as we know, it's the, the, um, who was it again? Lumen? No. Lu wh whoever. Uh, in the end, uh, it's, you know, it says that the protagonist and its behavior is always dependent on the system. And I was wondering how you, what are your design principles to create Agora Rollberg, to create this kind of more sustainable, more conscious behavior, actually, of the, of the protagonist or the community? So um, we started Agora, the first space, in 2011. So it's five and a half years ago. It was a very organic process of kind of filling out uh, a space without putting labels on it too much, but uh, looking back on it now, how does a community thrive? Where do people feel the space to develop things, try out things? So I really see um, Agora as a place, or my space as a, sp uh, as a place to open doors for people to, to, to try stuff out and to meet people where they can do so. Um, in Agora Rollberg, which is the second space we're opening now, we have a very long-term perspective, and we have the opportunity to establish this very organic, intuitional thing into a more formatted um, uh, project. And um, also there, because we, we have the, pro um, the perspective of building and um, building housing on top and really constructing, that we can take our beliefs and our values into every level of it. So how can we transform... Um, values that we share over dinner or that we share in an artwork or that we share in the club talking mm -hmm. into something that uh, actually resonates in a, in, a, in a bigger scale. So I, I lost the question there, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking if there are some design principles, but I like that you're describing uh, Rollback because it's, um, it's actually a bigger picture. So just go ahead, you know, what are the goals? Yeah. And so the goals are... Uh, so it was. It's actually a very interesting process because it's this uh, growing pains we're going through. I don't know if any of you had it, like when you're seven, eight, and you're in bed and everything hurts, but it's just part of gr of growing. So we we came from a pro process where it was very free spirited and and trying stuff out, and now with this new space, we're in a project. We're in a process where we really have to justify and think about what we're doing. No, so. Uh, what do we believe in? We want to create a more sustainable world. We don't believe in the structures that are given to us. So how can we translate this into our project? Mm -hmm. And because we have this long-term perspective, we can translate this into the architecture of it. So, okay, how can we build more sustainably? Can we reuse materials? Can we, um, uh, I don't know, design a system where the energy is being used in a sustainable way? But also, can the people that are doing the project own it. How much does the community have a say and how much not? Uh, I don't have a, an answer to that yet, but these are the questions we're dealing with. So the new project is very based on the, the aspect of circularity. So how does, a, how does a place feed itself somehow? So if we have a cafe, uh, can it maybe serve things that are being grown in a greenhouse we built? And maybe the person that is uh, renting a co-working desk and is developing something, can, can he prototype it in a wood workshop? Wow. So we're, we're trying to create a framework where people can, within this community, test different things out without... I mean, you create a framework in any way. I think limits are important yeah. for creation. But how, mu how, how, many sp how, how can we um, give space for ideas to circulate freely? So for an artist 
to do an exhibition and build it in the greenhouse that then maybe serves it in a cafe or not without imposing it. But how can we create a framework that feeds itself as much as possible? And how permanent are the people? How permanent is the community? Do they live really there or what's the plan? So the new space is really in the, in the, in the beginning. It's, mm -hmm. uh, it's being built as we speak. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so it's, We have a community. We, we've been building this, uh, our original space for five and a half years. And the new space is located only five minutes away. Mm -hmm. But um, it's all pretty much theory right now because we still have to get, get it started. But it's an exciting time to, yeah. to think of these things. Yeah, Yeah, Rome is much, much established already. I mean, you have already three spots, right? Uh, it's in Bali, it's in Madrid, it's in Miami. 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 <laughs> nice. Um, and so, uh, and uh, I thought it's interesting because actually, the the uh, how you proposed it, it's you designed the whole network, the global network for the digital nomads. Can you tell us what the digital nomad actually is and how to design for them a network of a cool living experience? You should never argue with the moderator, but it. Uh, um, <laughs> It's not built for it. So we do have a pretty broad audience. So okay. internally, yes, there is the kind of digital nomads or late 20s, designer from East London, programmer from San Francisco. But the appeal of Rome is also much broader. So we have a lot of couples in the late 30s who start questioning their priorities. Is that what we want to do for the rest of our lives? Or should we just live in a couple of different other countries for maybe a year or two? Yeah. And we also have a lot of empty nesters. So the kids are finally in college. We have all the money. We're still young. We are still fit. What do you we call want empty nesters. Empty nesters. Yeah. I've heard about that term. It's, I think it's an American term. It's basically okay. baby boomers whose kids left and just okay. call them every two months okay. or so. Yeah. <laughs> so and how 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 um, how is your space then designed, the Rome space? So how does it look like when you when you come there uh, when you're say it's very broad. It's, we don't do much community design in the sense of that in an exclusive way. Uh, we don't do curation, for example, in the sense that Soho House does, that we say, okay, it's very specifically targeted who we want to be and who we want to see there. And also not how Silicon Valley sometimes, mm -hmm. this, where the first step is, hey, let's write a manifesto for the next six months and then yeah. see who shows up. So the places are pretty open architecturally. It's mostly former hotels. So okay. that's something where we say there needs to be a clear distinction between public and private. Um, but people don't care so much about square footage and uh, square meters anymore. Um, so how can I f have a place that I can fill with random stuff? Mm -hmm. But what's the location? Who else is going to be there? Can I walk to all the interesting neighborhoods and so on? So small private space, private bathroom, private bedroom, mm -hmm. and a lot of public space and a lot of utility value. And that's okay. best served by hotels because there isn't so much ground up co-living development at the moment. Yeah. So for the next one or two years, we repurse, repurpose existing hotels. Okay. And um, Can I just say something about, I think absolutely. the interesting about uh, Rome or all the spaces is in the end people want access to mm -hmm. things, no? So it's about being able to be flexible and move around. I think that's digital nomadism. I, I have difficulties with the term, but it's easy, I guess, to understand something. Yeah. It's about... How, how many? I was just wondering how many people know about the term of digital nomads here. Hands up. How many okay. are digital nomads? <laughs> <laughs> who, who is a digital nomad? One, two, okay, three, how four, many five, six. Kind of are, but wouldn't self-define them <laughs> as digital nomads. <laughs> <laughs> Some hands are coming up. Okay. Yeah, I think it's also a, co a quite interesting way of living, actually, because talking about loneliness, I, lo a lot of people who are doing it, they are actually quite of, you know, traveling a lot. And um, yeah, but it's about... I, I mean, these spaces tr kind of fill up what the church used to be, I don't know how many years ago, no? It's like yeah. uh, you, you go to a place and you just be, yeah. but you have the opportunity to meet other people, like-minded people. We have that a lot in Agora. People, I mean, you work on online. You don't have. You can be in your apartment and miserable, and just <laughs> or not. I mean, it's good. Some people like to be more alone. You but after a couple of months, maybe you want to just maybe not even interact, but you want to have other people around you. And yeah, I, yeah. I guess these spaces come in for that. Yeah. How, how does it work at the camp actually? So who is coming to the? I mean, you did yeah. the first camp now in Greece, right? Yes, uh, that's interesting and because for who if was there? If you if if you imagine the life of a digital nomad who moves uh, between countries every month, yeah. then those camps are the only places where they can meet their communities. Yeah. 
because afterwards they it's like more like a tribe they go once in a year they go to this camp then they follow the global streams to the south hemisphere if it's uh, winter here towards and then the sun, no? towards this always towards the sun <laughs> and mm -hmm. and so we we tried one of our, our camp was kind of a mixture we had a lot of global digital nomads um who make money in in passive income ways and it's really interesting if you listen to those people because uh, it's it's a total it, it's a, a a world a bubble in itself if you understand how they make money and then we brought we, we brought some uh co regular people like me i mean i have never been in a camp like this and um uh, but what I realize is there's a lot of the, the spectrum is really wide, and I realize that uh, the digital nomads are just uh, the the cutting edge example of what a lifestyle can be, and 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 there's a big mainstream that follows behind that, and also wants to be more flexible, and maybe move, the, uh, change the city in a, on a yearly basis, and it's a, a general nomadism uh, that I think is a big trend in the future, and. That's a big thing. Yeah, it's, it's not those extreme guys, those yeah. freaks yeah. sometimes. Yeah, it's, it's just a milieu then, yeah. which is also coming up kind of. It's really, really, really early. So, so pretty much all companies, including ours, are two or three years too early. So we have very few people who go all in on Rome. So it's a lot of people who say, mm, I want to take three or four weeks off, work on this project, and I do it yeah. from Bali instead of Berlin because it's depressing in February. Okay. And... Um, yes. I really I think, think <laughs> what you also said about access. So it is about providing this access to new forms of living, to yeah. different experience, different cities. But it's all mostly a trial mode at the moment. So it's people who call living. It sounds kind of weird. I'd rather keep my own apartment, <laughs> yeah. Airbnb it, and give it a try for maybe a month or yeah. two. And but it's funny you say Airbnb as a commodity already. I mean, that's already uh, a <laughs> step into the... No? Like, I'd rather have an own apartment and Airbnb it. I mean, mm. let's talk two years back. This was not on the table even, you know? So that's kind of pushing that limit yeah. in a way. I was also wondering, I mean, building up a community is also a lot about a collaboration. And um, what kind of methods did you apply, you know, that people are start working together at the camp, for instance, in Greece? Yes. How does it, it's what happened there? It's interesting, like, people always ask, is it a holiday? And then they're like, yeah, it's not a holiday. Uh, or you are not working. No, sorry, I, I started wrong. They usually say like, ah, you're not really working on this beach, right? Yeah. And it's, I think it's a new category, what, what those camps are. And I've, it's a converge, it's a combination between actually co-living in a way, because you live there together for 10 days. It's also a kind of a co-working space, temporary, but it's also a lot of leisure time. And we, what we, how you can imagine this, we, have, we, we were 50 people, and every morning there's a check-in where everybody can speak up and say, look, I need this today, or I have this problem. It's, r it's really fast. It only takes 10 minutes. And then we, everybody offers also a workshop during those 10 days that people... They're coming up with their workshops and th and th uh, yeah. themselves? So there's w one super uh, uh, successful uh, um, podcaster, and he tells everybody else how to do that. Oh, there's a guy who knows how to do acrobatics. He's actually here. I saw Logan earlier. <laughs> and he gives an ac acrobatic uh, workshop uh, down at the beach where nobody can get hurt because there's sand. <laughs> and and so and uh, what well, the amazing thing is, I was afraid a little bit that this will be a party thing where everybody gets incredibly drunk in the evening. But it didn't happen. People were very focused on what they wanted to achieve. In the in the beginning of the week, you also everybody says, "Look, this is what I want to achieve: my personal goals, my 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 professional goals." And then you kind of ask each other, "Hey, how is it going? Did you finish that blog post?" And in a way, I was although I started the organization and kind of was one of the organizers, I was also really impressed by taking part. You know, because I didn't in believe the workshops and yeah, in the whole thing, I didn't believe it would be like that. I thought maybe it would be more like holiday, or but it's really this intense ten days where you changed your mind about a lot of things and you learn a lot and you really come home and you're motivated and you. It's just it also gave me a lot of uh, uh, positive energy. And why ten days? So, so I mean, I thought because I, also, I already saw also people because last year I took part in another camp called POC Twenty One, yeah. and um, and yeah. in, and this took like five weeks, and I thought, wow, it was like I don't know. I feel ten days is this moment where you are still not bored enough by everybody, but uh, you it's it's not too long and not too short. You get to know okay. each other, and for me, it was I was thinking about it. I, it was a good decision. The last days, I was like. Phew, now it's time to go <laughs> home. Yeah, it's <laughs> enough. Yes, because yeah. you can get out of it also. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I see. 
Um, yeah, co, 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 co. I was um, <laughs> incredible. But I was also thinking, you know, how much co is actually possible. Because uh, in, the, in the end, you know, how much leadership does such a structure need and how much co-creation uh, is, is uh, needed in a way. What do you think about it? Oof, uh, uh, we're really figuring that out. Yeah. We're in the midst of it. I mean, and you uh, are pretty experienced, you know, with Agora already. Like, you Yeah, know, but still, yeah. it's funny. Like, yeah, you have a lot of experience, but you still really don't know how it really, yeah. you, you know, it's kind of like uh, feeling the wave because it, it's so personal also. Who's co-creating then also? It's very, it's very based on the people doing it. I think we went from a structure that was very flat and then from a structure where everyone had their own responsibilities yeah. and very defined and then oh no wait let's open up again so it's uh, it's about finding that balance because yeah. i think it's important for people to know wh who's responsible for what that's very important to know or else yeah. the you do the fun things and the annoying things get get left behind yeah. Uh, but you also don't want to limit people. You want to give people certain freedom to develop something. So it's a. Uh, I guess this whole also the camp you're talking about. It's about finding this this limit between leisure and work, per se. I mean, you you just made a a, a joking comment like, oh, "I was worried everyone was drunk." I, I was a secret confession. I developed a lot of projects in a bar, drunk with my friends. You know. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and that's a good thing, I guess. Uh, the best ideas, of course, you then yeah, have to go through. I'm the not talking about that drunk. No, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I mean the other one. Of course. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I guess the more people that are responsible, the more rules you need. Yeah. Um, so everyone knows where their place is and where they can be free. You know? mm -hmm. But um, or else it becomes a very personal thing in in the sense of. No, you can't do that. Oh, why not? You have to define certain rules. If you have the ground rules, everyone can play. Mm -hmm. And to define those, it, it, that's, a ch that's a challenge. Yeah, I thought it was also interesting because last year I heard the first time I learned about hidden power structures. Uh, I was not aware about that, but I, you know, when you, we talk about like a flat hierarchy, for instance, I learned that it is much more irritating if people are, don't know who is responsible for what and they don't have a role, that it's more stressful actually if there is a, like a total hierarchy. Have you ever seen, there's this, uh, actually, uh, my friend uh, Pedro, he sent me this uh, presentation about holacracy. I don't know if anyone is familiar with this. It's an organizational structure. How many people know about holacracy? Yeah, maybe it's a, it needs a little description, yes. It's a, it's a tool, it's an organizational structure tool, let's say. And the, the first slide of the presentation is really funny because they, they, they put a... Um, a hierarchy of a company, so you have the CEO and then you have each department and you have the people working in the department. And then the next slide is the secret power structure. So it's like, yeah. this person slept with that person, that person sells drugs to this person, this person lives with that person, this mother is friends from high school. And it's, it's In the end, you can put all kinds of terms in it. Yeah, yeah. It's people, you know, yeah. and they all have their stories and that's interesting. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. when it's really yeah. loose... You always have this. So when it's really loose, this can become an annoying thing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And that's also one of the reasons uh, a lot of the communes in the late 60s failed is because people are different and, and yeah. people have different ways of expressing their powers. So they had this completely flat structures where yeah. everybody could speak up, but it was kind of frowned upon to uh, uh, build teams or camps. So you had this extremely horrible hazing sessions and yeah. we did something wrong that you had all those comments in public and nobody was allowed to speak up for you. So, of course, you had different people uh, uh, expressing themselves differently. Yeah, always and have the power. Yeah. There is power. So it's not a question of how can you get rid of power, but how do you moderate it? How do you find the right structures to come up with joint decision-making and yeah. so on? I was just wondering because I thought that the Rome model is very exciting, actually, because you say, uh, okay, you can live there and you can just move from one. Like you pay once, right? And then you have access to all of them. Like you pay on a monthly basis. How does it work again? That's the long-term idea. Yeah. So eventually, instead of signing a lease, uh, we want to provide you a subscription that lets you move between cities. So mm -hmm. you don't sign a Mietvertrag here in Germany. Uh, you sign a Rome subscription and you can say, hey, I want to live six weeks in Berlin and I want to move to New York for two months and then I want to go to Tokyo. And you have always unique buildings that tell their own stories. You get access to the local community. Yeah. Um, arriving is much, much easier and so on. Um, Everything's different, yeah. but it follows the same basic rules behind the scenes, kind of. And I was just wondering, how does, it, how does then a normal day, so I come to Bali, 
How does it? What, what is a normal day? You were there, right, Christoph? Um, I come to. But you were drunk most of the time. The, the other <laughs> hanging on the pool. <laughs> Um, so how does how does it look like? So uh, is the, how do you create community actually at these places, and how is the you know the also the roaming process look like? So when I go from Bali to Miami, what's happening there? Is it kind of do you, do you design this process, or is it just okay? You come and you get a key. We are, and I think that's a little bit owed to me being more of a sociopath who grew up on, in a very rural countryside and sitting alone on a tree by myself for my first 15 years. We try to do it more around product. So uh, what we do, for example, in all the places is, so you have your private bedroom, private bathroom, and you also have your personal fridge space. So we get those uh, large glass fridges where you get your own compartment. So you arrive in Bali, and in your second day, you uh, go to the communal kitchen. You can also go to the restaurant we have on the rooftop, mm -hmm. but you can go to the communal kitchen and cook yourself a breakfast and actually meet someone there who's been living in Bali for six weeks and you ask them hey what's the best day trip or what's the best uh, uh, cocktail bar in the neighborhood right. Right. and you immediately lower that barrier or you could look at a large glass fridge and see uh, hey, actually where did you get that yogurt from mm -hmm. and so it's about reducing that friction because a lot of the infrastructure we live in was built for the 20th century so long leases etc so how can we remove those barriers by making it much much easier to find out where can you have a decent drink what's the best yogurt and yeah actually meet people and ease into that but the idea is to have it more happen behind the scenes and not in the yeah. sense of here's uh, the house rules and here's how you have to behave yeah, yeah. it's more like this uh, i think it's the sterne lyrics of uh, wir sind die bühne nur und nicht das drama uh, um, so we try try to provide a stage and whatever people are doing with it uh, um, is up to them okay and um, yeah, co-owning, this is also a very interesting thing because you just mentioned that. Uh, I think you at, uh, at the Agora Rolfe, you also have um, a very interesting model with the Erbrecht. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Because I think this is super exciting, uh, talking about having really uh, developing a space uh, for, uh, for a long run. Sure. <laughs> so uh, one of the big, one of the major uh, limits we were facing with our original space were, were a very classic landlord situation. So we rented a space, we were a group of friends, and we were trying stuff out, and we started renting more space. And it was like um, six years ago, pretty easy, and then things change, and you don't have security all of a sudden, no? So um, what really changes in the new space is that we... Um, we got uh, connected to a, a foundation. I didn't know that existed. I thought it was fairy dust. When I heard it first, I was like, what's this? <laughs> but this is a foundation that uh, buys property to save it from market speculation. The Holzmarkt, for whoever is uh, familiar with this project here in Berlin, have a similar construct. So they buy a property and they uh, give a leasehold of from 85 to 100 years. This is great because it protects all kinds of things. It protects... Uh, I'm going to talk about me now. It, pr it protects uh, me as a project uh, manager uh, from speculation. So I, I have a very long-term perspective of developing something. But it also pr protects my my project in general from myself, from my own ego maybe, that I go in 10 years and I'm like, well, I'm going to cash out and I'm going to sell because you can't sell the property. So you have a, an access to the space for 85 years, which is long. Um, so this is this is what we're facing with the new space, and this is what made us um, even have the opportunity to think about uh, building housing or even think about longer term projects. Because in the old space, it's not like that at all. It's like, ooh, wait, what's going to happen in when you start projecting your plans? It it, it affects, no? Yeah. So the longer you can also live there, you uh, at, you plan also that you build apartments there. The the plan is now there's a, a two and a half thousand square meter property uh, built, uh, which would be a, a, an open usage space with mm -hmm. multi functions. And the idea is that in a year and a half time we build apartments on top. Mm -hmm. um, my co-director Kaiki he always says there's a limit to togetherness. So I think that's an interesting phrase to put in this co everything. Uh, it's. Where is this limit, no? I think yeah. what, what Christoph was saying first, it's great to, you work 10 hours and you're really passionate and you go home and the person you go home to, be it your partner or your roommate, doesn't care, really. I mean, they care because it's you, but they don't really know what you're talking It's good. It's, yeah, yeah. it's healthy. So how much togetherness is good? And so um, we're now in the very technical phase of, of planning the construction and then uh, a very interesting phase comes in how do we actually 
activated, no? What kind of people are going to live there? Are they all going to live and work down there? I think there's great opportunities, but it also sounds scary somewhere. Like, oh, is this healthy? Like, is everyone... So, so what's the balance there? Yeah, yeah. I think uh, it's a very good point in the end because we were talking about uh, Darwin. Yeah. And actually, uh, you know, so a mixture is more prepared than, of course, like monoculture. So, and every, when, when we talk about co-living, we, we hear a lot. It's uh, about like m like-minded people. And I was thinking, you know, how much diversity needs to be, how uh, exclusive do you need to be, but how inclusive you have to be. Uh, with local communities, um, if it is in Greece, if it is in Bali, if it is in Neukölln. So what do you think about that? I think diversity is, <laughs> <laughs> is just it's a key to that. If you have a big space with many people, it's the chance that low you get bored or you get annoyed because you can always go to the other corner of the whole thing. And then the flexibility in terms of changing people around or giving people the opportunity to go to another location also helps. And then, and it's then the third thing is having the rules that kind of facilitate this exchange. And if you have really good rules, um, do and you, you have rules for that? Um, f in the camps, we have rules. Wow, this is like a stu I cannot answer that question. Now we, there are different rules for different situations. In yeah. the in the co-working space, uh, there are a couple of locations where you cannot talk or where it's uh, accepted that you don't have phone calls. This is like a rule that, that doesn't annoy anybody. Yeah. And also, there's like lots of other things that we offer to make the work day easy. In a co-working camp, it's more that you have the schedule that allows people to do what they want half of the day and the rest of the day. They, they are, everybody accepts when coming there that there's a workshop and people are interested in workshops. Mm -hmm. And this is always different. In a co-living space, I don't know, it depends if you are having a very flexible co-living space where you can come to uh, just, where you can stay for a week or for a month. Probably there are different rules than a space where people live together for 10 years. Um, it's defining also who you want to please, no? I, yeah. Uh, with our community, I see a lot of comp uh, not conflicts, it's just interesting, uh, different feedbacks like from people that uh, just come for the first time or they're a couple of months in, they're like, oh, this is great and the community dinners and I can do this. And then the people that are there for four years and they're like, listen, I'm kind of, it's, of course it's nice to meet new people, but yeah, you know, it's tiring sure. also. Yeah. And uh, uh, it's choosing, w not just choosing who you want to please, but like be a neutral spot where everyone can find their own way. It's not it's not easy, <laughs> but for one thing, for one example for uh, just r was remembering it in, in Beta House. We have s there are so many people. We have 500 members, and uh, the the local culture and the rules are so strong that people, if they enter, they re either like it or not, and if they don't like it, they leave again. So it's kind of I don't know what you call this. This is ex is it exclusive? But nobody chooses. It's just the people themselves choose yeah. the place they want to go. But this works. Uh, in they a choose way. their peers, in the, or their, uh, of course, the uh, community is like evolving. But how is it then in Bali, for instance? You know, being there at Rome, are you like connecting to the local community, or is there an exchange? Do you curate this exchange? Absolutely, we don't curate it too strongly. So I think, like a lot of things in life, is, is don't take yourself too serious about it. So, so we are not this, oh, we need to have exactly those event series. Yeah. What we do is that we ask the local community, the managers, to follow a certain program. But then it's absolutely up to them what they're doing. And that's that program is about bringing local initiatives in mm -hmm. by providing the event space, by providing the F&B space. It's exactly, it's a framework. And then they go out there and say, hey, let's offer this arts initiative for their show or event space or... Let's have this crazy Tupac fan, sous vide chef next door, uh, host a barbecue. So that's totally up to them. And that works really, really well. Yeah. So, again, not taking ourselves too serious that it has to be super exclusive, uh, uh, where no tourists are going, etc. But it's just, hey, we're part of this but neighborhood. But it's so and we important to create a framework, no? Because I think what we've developed, uh, experienced a lot in Agora is like, mm -hmm. everyone can participate. No where, where, where and what? Uh, wait a second, and and then someone does something. No, this not. It's very important to create a framework, yeah. no, because or else it becomes this very frustrating interpersonal. Then we have this power structures we're talking about. Yeah. But if you create a, pr a framework, for example, okay, we have these five type of events, or uh, and you do whatever you want with them. Then people can 
express themselves super free. But if there's no limit or no framework, then it, it, then it depends on interpersonal relationships and then it gets messy. Okay. <laughs> Epic. Epic. Yeah, yeah talk, talking about, because also, um, like you said, that uh, Agora Rollfeld also, you know, in its concept, of course, wants to kind of, you know, uh, work against gentrification. And I was also, or kind of, you know, because of this long-term project that, that you don't, that the rent is not rising uh, um, too mm. much. But, but, but. <laughs> yes, we want that. But I'm, I'm very honestly, it's also, uh, I, I, we had a community event the other day where we asked people what Agora is and we had many beautiful things. But one of the critical thing was like, Agora is a hipster UFO. <laughs> What's a UFO? UFO, like U a UFO. ET, UFO, UFO, UFO. UFO, UFO. Okay, okay. <laughs> um, a bubble. Yeah. And uh -huh. yes, we have uh -huh. the wish to bridge, yeah. but in the end, like, let's rewind five years ago, it's also 20 people on a MacBook in Neukölln. Yeah. But of course, it's, it's people with... Uh, uh, so, so, so for us, I mean, uh, very personally, it's been like, okay, let's first try to be able to pay the rent and, and secure the structure, and then when we're stable, we're able to maybe bridge better mm -hmm. so we have a, a super strong passion about bridging and being social and but it's also a constant challenge i think in everything in life to be able to talk to people that don't speak your own language and i'm not talking about language here but different experience fields no yeah. and i think pedro really wants to say something yes come yes pedro started agora in 2011 <laughs> long time ago <laughs> hello to so pedro I, I think I think I think to your question because I think it's a really relevant question. Mm. I think uh, the whole the whole project of Agora within Kindle is one project within a bigger frame of other projects, and there there are other buildings to be built there. They are only serving uh, communities that are not favored yeah. in society. So it's a big mixture of things. And in general, the whole idea is to lower the barrier of entry because if you create this sort of type of ownership, you can make sure that over long term, the accessibility in terms of price is going to stay low. And so you create much more uh, possibilities for people. But of course, then there are all the social connections and the type of groups of people that are already inherited in the space. And this will influence the process. But I do think that there is a big thinking an intention around creating a framework that can sustain this diversity yeah. and make something that is actually purposeful. Yeah. But to get their language is very important. What kind of terms we use co-living, co-owning, collaboration. The yeah, people, my, my neighbor in Neukölln doesn't use these terms. You know? How do you speak to that person and then make that? Because uh, it's, it's a super beautiful concept, but how do you translate that and create it like this low barrier of entrance W uh, it's it actually not a new concept, of course. You can go course back to tribalism. Of course not. End. It's yeah. not. But, yeah. So, and at the same time, I mean, if you look around, especially in, 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 in big urban surroundings, <laughs> we have all these, we have, oh, you have your fans here. <laughs> Um, when you look around these urban surroundings, I mean, you have all these like we live in New York now and also in London. So there are, but all these, uh, there are a lot of concepts who are more uh, seems like mini apartment uh, uh, concepts uh, with a community manager actually. And I was wondering because there are also then this other direction where you see right now um, like really a, a housing crisis, you know, in London and in New York uh, where people just cannot live in the inner centers anymore. And they start squatting houses again, actually, because they just I think cannot that's afford great. To I think they should. So it's really this huge variety in the end. And I was just uh, wondering what you think about, you know, this when you when you think about co-living, how can co-living actually uh, help to s to have more community in the inner cities of big urban surroundings, or is it again, you know, like feeding a very monoculture in the inner surround inner surroundings? So what do you think about that? I think, unfortunately, it's also a way to raise the revenue per square meter because co-living means also to use space more efficient yeah. and to make the rent lower while more people, c I mean, can, can share one house. And I don't know what... I feel the, the, the war about real estate in big cities is lost and I don't know how to fix that, really. I like those kind of projects. Pedro has an yes. answer. <laughs> 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 That's good. I think there's two points to, to that that I c 
could capture in the conversation. Mm -hmm. The first point is the point of ownership. So I think it's really, really important to rethink the question of ownership. And I think there's two ways that are being done right now. The first one is with this airport, and you can do it with a foundation, and then you can determine what this ownership is, which means, in practical terms, that is non-extractive, yeah? Mm -hmm. So that you are not extracting from this ownership, and that you can build something on the long term with with a with a with a contract with a social contract, and with the concept of airport. This is how exactly yeah. because the point is that our ownership stru structure that we understand in the world mm -hmm. is inherited from the Roman times. And the ownership structure is we say we have something that we own that is to be working for us. And so I think there is a misconception or there is alternative ways to understand this concept of ownership once you go forwards to, th to things like co-sharing and so on because then you're talking about another paradigm of, of doing things and you cannot do things with a in another paradigm if you are operating with the infrastructure from the old paradigm. So I think there has to be a lot of rethinking there. This is, will be the first point. And I think the second point that has to be thought, and I think it would be very interesting to, to get deeper into, which is the governance point. And there, there are lots of methodologies being tried out all over the world, mm. such as holacracy, because I think this is just a, a minor example for that. And I think that that there is a lot to be discovered there too. So if you combine the governance and the other ownership structure, you are able to really see what the beginning of a new paradigm that we're talking about. Yeah. And I guess, yeah. Yeah, great, thank you. I was still wondering what are you thinking about it? <laughs> thank you, Pedro. Co-living per se doesn't make a difference, I think it's the biggest question we as a generation have to solve is who will own all the assets, who will own all the robots. And that's definitely something we're not yet doing a good job at. And that's something where we need to find good forms. And if you talk to Miguel from WeWork, uh, one of the co-founders, he always had this idea, oh, and eventually WeWork will be owned by the community, but then your investors call you and ask you about the margins, and you say, yeah, maybe let's try it next summer. And so you, at one point, you have to have the discipline to actually say, let's give this a try and re let's rethink the model. I'm more convinced that it comes more from a hierarchical structure, uh, somebody building s a system and then saying, okay, now let's flip the switch. Uh, yeah. uh, like Juno, for example, the ride-sharing company that's now starting in New York that says we want to be more of a peer-to-peer -peer model, mm -hmm. uh, a true peer-to-peer -peer model. So I think it's more coming from a capitalist notion, um, but it's definitely a responsibility that we have to get good at because if we continue on the current trajectory, uh, um, there is no sustainable future. So co-living includes... Uh, um, places in San Francisco that are former warehouses that look like prisons in uh, Texas where you have 20 rows of bunk beds that are rented for 80 bucks a night because that's the only affordable housing stock that's in wow. the city anymore. Yeah. So it's a wide definition per se doesn't make a difference, but the root cause is inequality. And the reason you have donut cities like New, uh, uh, London, for example, where a lot of Belgravia Mayfair is owned by people who might be there maybe one week in the whole yeah. year. Yeah. The root cause for that is inequality. So if you rethink that ownership and offer new models, that could be a fund even uh, um, that allows you to buy very small chunks of fractional ownership, yeah. and then you gradually, hopefully, get back on a track that's more sustainable, that's more equal, and gives everybody equal access, access to asset ownership. I was also wondering, because we, most of the time we're talking about uh, um, uh, city environments, uh, but how how is it to bridge actually you know the 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 rule with their with their um, yeah more urban surroundings in a digital age actually it should be more easy right I mean to to organize a virtual um, community and to live on the countryside and have the fresh air and work with friends and we're looking at those models so for example we're looking at it in Japan uh, uh, where the government tries to do a lot where you work in an ur urban core in the morning and then instead of in a rush hour you drive home around noon with a train and then yeah. you're in the village next to the train station you have a co-working space you do the remainder of your work and then you go home to this beautiful rural uh, uh, place or i mean obviously spain italy that yeah. there are whole stretches vast stretches where you can have beautiful beautiful buildings i think we're not there yet as a society and as a culture people still want to be in the urban core you want to go to your uh, um, get that 
cafe latte from the bearded tattooed guy on the reclaimed hardwood floor and that's still the priority and yeah. that's density and that's density of networks and so it still takes some time for people to loosen up there and alternative uh, offerings uh, uh, frederick is sitting here he's trying to get a uh, uh, Baugruppe of a communal living space outside of Berlin done, okay. but very early days. But we'll get there, no, hopefully. No. <laughs> <laughs> Should okay. we hug him? Do you want to hug him? You're alone out there. Please. <laughs> Close <to me. laughs> nice. So what is your perspective on the rule and the bridging the rule and the, and the, the urban... I think... Because also the camp was, was in Greece on the beach, yes. right? Um, well, it's... It, it's quite rural there, but I th I'm, it's basically a question of the tools. We are human beings, we are physical, so we need to meet in person to form a certain type of relationship with each other. And then we can continue and Skype and, and virtually, virtually you can also do a lot, but the key in the end is to meet each other and then go, then, then you go somewhere else and then you meet. And in a way, I feel cities are the major meeting point mm -hmm. and so are maybe some holiday destinations and... Um, there's no other way. I don't think it's possible to do... M maybe with virtual reality, I really started to think about it recently because it's fucking... It's scary, but it's really... Uh, maybe there something will develop that probably nobody of us likes, but then in the end will do. And uh, <laughs> like so many things... Um, you're literally the third person who says that today, and you're all terrifying <laughs> me. Yes, so I think it's basically, uh, um, yeah, I actually said all I wanted to say. It's meeting in person and then being virtually engaged with each but other. But I think at the camp it's very interesting because uh, you're, you're managing, you're setting up actually a, a real a local community with each camp you're organizing. But then there everyone is going and leaving and what's happening afterwards? Is there a kind of... Yeah. A visual management? How do you transform that? Well, um, part of my life I thought about the perfect project management tool or stuff to keep in touch, but actually it's a Facebook messenger group okay. and <laughs> and it works really well and people send each other stuff and if it would be a couple of years ago, maybe it would be only me uh, text messaging and uh, so it's really interesting because when you spend 10 days with each other, it's a really strong experience and then you have a reason to stay in touch. And it and just happens, right? I think it's also about not formulating everything so much. I think uh, in my experience in Agora, like formatting certain things, we lose certain people. We do. Mm -hmm. And you create an event and people meet there and maybe we don't have a control over it, but they will... If they like each other, they will do stuff together. I think yeah. it's it's about loosening up the structures also and just the walk the walk and don't talk the talk kind of thing. Yeah. Okay, so let's create stuff and let's do things and then people have autonomy and intelligence and will to do things together and that just, just happens. Holding the space. I think when it's too formatted, it, uh, uh, that's my personality yeah. at least. Yeah. I get like, yeah, I don't want to be part of this somehow. And Which is funny because yeah, I'm... Yeah. How does it manage this room? Because you also have this network, this global network of, of, of people who are like skipping from one place to the other. Is there like also a virtual platform where people can meet then? Or is it just, okay, you have the local spaces and you arrive and then it's happening face to face? It's still mostly Facebook as well. So we do have this alumni group. We have a <laughs> Facebook group for pretty much every location. And it's by we tried Slack. We, we try to uh, do more of the work on our own platform early on. But it's, at the end of the day, everybody lives on Facebook. So. Yeah. But, you know, it's, it's one really simple thing I learned. And I just, although running a uh, co-working space for, for nine years, um, I just learned that what if you have this group named uh, uh, co-working camp Lemnos uh, and you have the set amount of people and you don't add some new people there and you know that that's the way how people interact if you constantly have a group and you have different reasons why people are in this group then it suddenly st uh, stops working mm -hmm. so it's like really random but I realized this that um, psychology is behind that I think pff, you just need a reason to talk to each other and yeah. not many reasons just one um, you just mentioned the bearded, tattooed guy. It, it seems, you know, that all these co-living spaces are mainly, like, designed for a very bohemian single crowd, actually. I was wondering, you know, uh, how do you design a space for, like, also families or for all stages of life? 
um, how you how you consider that actually? We, we do again. That's a little bit like the digital nomad uh, thing. So we do have families, um, support families, and absolutely welcome both in Bali and in Miami. We still have to figure it out in the urban places, and that's widely accepted. We even sometimes have multi-generational stays where the grandparents uh, uh, really? wow. uh, uh, just take some time off, and then you have the freelance parents uh, working out of the co-working space, and the kids just play around by themselves. That was one of the most beautiful stories When w was when... Lou, she was a um, seven-year-old daughter from a single mom, uh, got into, obviously, it's Ubu, so yoga is not very far away. And she did yoga teacher training, and she, on the rooftop spot, got out her favorite pets and rolled out the mats every day in the morning and then put a pet on each of the yoga mats, and then she was the yoga teacher. And that actually works quite well, and it, it's very natural, the interaction between people sitting in a co-working space, uh, uh, people taking some time off, and kids being all around it, so... We definitely try to support it, and it works surprisingly well and yeah. easily. So, okay. nice. Yeah, I think most of the questions that are asked when talking about this digital nomadism uh, concern families. Mm. I mean, this is a critic point. Everybody at some point says, "Yeah, but wait, who can do that when you have a family?" Right. And <laughs> I think uh, it's a valid question because in I also need to go to the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, we have a discussion going on here. <laughs> but it's not a profit. No, but but uh, so I, I think uh, that the reason is oh, wh what you can do, oh, what we have to imagine is that um, if you have globally traveling communities, bringing children is not such a big problem. And I also, I also think we have to think about education in a different way. Because when I did my research, I found the topic world schooling, which is... Uh, which means that pe parents travel with their kids and teach their kids uh, the stuff uh, that happened. I mean, they kind of use the the, the locations they go to mm -hmm. to teach. Um, I just imagined uh, learning Greek history then in Greece, uh, which is probably naive, but um, the whole... No, the whole very <laughs> present. <yeah. laughs> Thank you, Hannah. <laughs> <laughs> so it it's basically... Um, Creating this community, educative community, also around uh, educate uh, around uh, families, mm -hmm. and um, I think we will see that in the future because the way we think education works right now, in a local school, having to stay there for years, uh, um, is not working. I think. So, are there new concepts that are coming up uh, or came up in in the camp? What you witnessed? How to we just thought in the camp we might add we, we might just add uh, uh, somebody who creates a program for kids. You know, we have the the grown up program, so maybe we have like a a track for I don't know a certain age where kids can also learn something. Okay. Um, yeah, I think we are. My last question, I would say, before we open up to the to the audience, uh, what were your biggest challenges? you were facing in setting up your your concepts, I would say, in creating space for... There are so many. I want to think a little bit about it. So <laughs> Just a nice story <laughs> you want to share. Um, it's, it's a question of... You mentioned system design in the beginning. Yeah. And if you... So, so we need to, obviously, Silicon Valley investors gave us money because they want to see a scalable company, but also it's about access. So we want to offer people new lifestyle and hopefully a lot of people the, the freedom to live anywhere they want and find good human connection. At the same time, we have to build real estate. So if you look at hospitality, the, the reasons, uh, um, for example, Soho House isn't uh, sometimes commercially a little bit challenging is because you have a creative genius and you have a very hierarchical structure. So uh, you have a person somewhere choosing all those fabrics and uh, changing the marble bar seven times and that's where you then start losing the money. And so how can you design a system that's... Uh, um, even WeWork looks the same all over the world. Yeah. W looks the same all yeah. over the world. So how can you create a good, meaningful experience that's unique, but at the same time also reliable? So how it's also a little bit local, probably. Absolutely local, that's the yeah. thing. So, so uh, our places look completely different. The one in Bali is a very I contemporary... Do you feel, uh, is authenticity scalable? 
It is if you're, uh, uh, again, don't take yourself too serious. You have to trust people. And, and you have to, if we retain a design firm globally, then it will be a globalized design. And uh, if we say, let's find a unique local design firm and let's give Quirky firms a shot, and that's something that you can write into whatever framework you define, yeah. then you can do that. I mean, the downside is a couple of places will be shitty. shitty, in my <laughs> opinion, okay. absolutely, but it's still okay. So scalability is your, is your biggest challenge at the moment? For me personally, yes. Yeah, I'm thinking a lot about that, how to grow something in an authentic way and um, what is the personality behind what kind of brand or words. or Yeah, that's what I'm personally thinking about a lot. Yeah. And there's no solution. I don't yeah, think anything has a solution. Yeah, I'm a process junkie. It's okay, all, pro it's all part of the process. And uh, I think um, my partner once said, uh, Kaiki, he once said, someone was talking about Agora and so cool what you did. And he's like, okay, we just opened the doors. And I think it's very much about that. So if you have a structure where you allow people to just walk through the doors and make it, it's what you make of it, if you allow that, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Without taking the credit of something like WeWork, I think it's it's fair enough. It's not what I want to do, but it's I think it's uh, there's a demand for it. So yeah, yeah. different flavors. Yeah. So I was thinking about it, and uh, <laughs> 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 I <laughs> no, but really one thing, the biggest one of the biggest also uh, resolutions was that um, that I w we started with kind of a dream to make this workspace that everybody likes, also ourselves. And um, when you start working on it, suddenly the consequences of what you're doing is can can be a nightmare <laughs> because you yeah. didn't don't think about that you need to have the cleaning service and all those things that... Be careful you what you wish for. Yes, exactly. Be careful what you wish for. And I think that was the biggest thing that I didn't think about and that was uh, really painful <laughs> in the end. Okay. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Thank you. To, uh, uh, please give an applause to this beautiful round. <laughs> so I think we already learned a lot, but I guess there are some questions in the audience. Um, here's a microphone. If you don't have a... <laughs> Try it without. <laughs> <laughs> Just shout. No, I'm Did stuck. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, you can be on Yeah, yeah. Hi, everybody, and thank you so much. Um, so I work for a big tech company, so I was really interested when you mentioned virtual reality. <laughs> uh, and I would really like to explore that topic a little bit and, like, how will virtual reality help shape these co-living, co co-working, and all these co-spaces in the future? You know, <laughs> I think... Thank you for the question. Uh, <laughs> If uh, without a lot of thinking, I just realized that then if, if you don't need a space anymore, you just need the, the virtual, virtual reality headset, probably it's not needed. But I think that is really short, like sh really quickly after just a second thinking about it, probably there's a more sophisticated answer. Have you an opinion on that? Oh, it just scares me. Yeah. But I think when it's there, I'm sure it brings a lot of creativity. But I'm I'm still in the phase where I'm like, yeah, no, let's just make a little fire and talk about stuff and yeah. just slow down a bit. And Cars are I'm too fast. We need horses. <laughs> <laughs> I think what an interesting. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Then, then, yeah, I think 
because you've experienced it before, you don't do the same mistakes, you've already seen how it works, without even the I think what because we also <laughs> used uh, we also used the term you probably you remember modern modern tribalism in the beginning, and I also wondered um, and it's actually already going a little bit in this direction how what can we learn actually from old methods how we get together uh, if it is the fireplace or whatever and uh, if we can if or should we is it necessary to combine it with new technology I think this is a little bit. The, the meta question of what you try to say. <laughs> yes, but they are also. Yeah. I think there's also a slight disconnect because I think uh, it's a really good question. Uh, Christoph was more speaking of the living in virtual reality indefinitely yeah. versus there's definitely a huge value of being able to check into uh, Agora or Beta House from some other remote location or even just to see the place beforehand before you get on a plane to actually go there. So yes, it's definitely supporting and you see it in a lot of other areas. But what about this mysticism of like going I somewhere know. and not knowing exactly what it is I and know. not having this expectation on it and just like, hey, it's moment, what's going to happen? I, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, old fashioned. No, no. That's my question about scalability. Like how do you... Yeah. Hi, I'm Daniel from uh, Brooklyn, and um, something uh, Brooklyn, yeah. And um, so this question that came up a little bit earlier that was touched on a little bit is really interesting to me about access and uh, the ability for people to go to these spaces. Um, I organized something like this camp in New York and really struggled with finding a place that was affordable for true for creatives that want to create for the sake of creating. Um, versus people who are, have a bigger source of income. So I'm curious as to what models you guys think about um, to get away maybe from just the capitalist-driven one. Like what sort of models you've experimented with in that, in that realm? I guess, I guess, I mean, we touched upon those <laughs> models before, right? I mean, you touched about the, upon those models, like you have to lower the barrier of entry to accessibility to the space and you can do that through changing the ownership structure of the spaces not being so extractive so that means you are you are diminishing the the the, the sort of vc driven model that is trying to extract as much value as possible so that means the accessibility of the space gets uh, cheaper and so when you go for asking for a space in a project like this they don't have the 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 need to have to sell it for so much for you so i guess but then it's is really changing the model uh, behind the things, and I think that's that's perhaps. I mean, there's there's a lot of frameworks for that, but I think this needs to have a, a dedicated panel to it because it's a very very uh, deep topic. Yeah, maybe so, if there's any examples of like it in action or like what? Yeah, okay. there are examples in action. I'm happy to share with however it is. There's like models for that. <laughs> I guess we, c we, but it's yeah. I think in general. Um, we are lucky to have investors who, on this, I don't know, someone like a collaborative fund who backed Kickstarter and has no problem with them turning into a B Corp. Um, so there is definitely a certain openness also there from an investor perspective, especially from long-term thinking investors uh, uh, who understand that the future needs different solutions. I think at the end of the day, San Francisco is not working as a housing market because it's a very complicated structure. You have landowners, you have lenders. So if you build shit, that the sausage is produced in a certain way. So, so you have to find ways. Sometimes you can get lucky, but it's not very scalable. Uh, you find somebody who owns a warehouse and is totally fine to say, yeah, you can do it because I don't really care about the money. I derived income from this other 18 apartment buildings. But I think in the long run, you have to rethink ownership. And, and you just have to buy all that shit and just distribute the ownership, uh, ownership uh, a little bit more evenly. <laughs> or squatted. <laughs> or squatted, that's the alternative. Uh, there's a there. I wouldn't Can squat in Brooklyn, though. Can you come up? Yeah, there's a microphone. <laughs> just shout. Uh, okay, as you I like. Shout. Just, just shout. Um,
Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's uh, Jonathan from Unsettled is actually I think right now in our Bali location. So it it is a pretty small cabal, and and it goes back to this at the moment. And and I encourage everyone that if you're somehow interested in that area, it's it's try to find a way to to contribute to it. it it's only a couple of us so far that think about like Unsettled. How can we? create those temporary homes that's pretty close to the camps, for example, that it's a monthly duration. It's, it's a group of people going somewhere. There is a guy um, called Jeff, I always forget what his name, Wilson, uh, doing a company cas called Casita, which takes the idea of a prefabricated apartment that's really affordable to a whole new level, where you could even do something like you just suggested, this Tom's model of uh, uh, pay for one, but actually we build two of them and we place them all over the globe. Um, so there is tremendous amount of things happening and it all comes down to rewiring our shared infrastructure for a completely new model because right now everything is built for the suburban home, 30-year mortgage, detached, atomized family and you have to change all of that. You, you have to change the legislative frameworks, you have to change the physical infrastructure and so on. So there's a ton of opportunity so by, please by all means if you're only remotely interested in that pick something and work on it and, and connect with us and help us to create this new infrastructure. What also comes to my mind, it's a great question, by the way, uh, is uh, the Project Pandora Hub. Uh, I don't know if you heard about that. It's actually, um, um, they are actually try to, to, to tackle the problem that in Spain uh, there are tons of villages who are abundant and they want to uh, kind of, you know, build co-ops around it and want to re bring people back to the rural country, and of course, but it's, uh, I mean it's, in China, the you heard about Are there answers? I think there are answers here also in the audience. There
into mainstream in the end, yeah. But that's happening right now. I think what people often underestimate is, is doing a successful venture, whatever it is, a business or a social movement, is a lot about timing. And it's sometimes it's underestimated how long it takes for society to absorb certain things. So Skype is around since 15 or 20 years, but working out of Bali is culturally only possible since one or two years. And and. So I guess the message is more this, now it's possible. So now it's really happening. And and that's not some, because we're working on a company doing something like this, but. So the ingredients are in place and there's enough people who really want to make a change and uh, who enough people who want to provide the infrastructure to make those changes possible. Perhaps, perhaps I want I like to answer a bit more to your question because it's, it, it's as I've as I have understood it because for example the 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 example of this foundation they have purchased more than hundred properties over the last ten years in Germany and they give a leasehold to the communities to be able to build on top of that so but as they aggregate the properties in a central company being a foundation that is owned by a foundation they can go and leverage these assets with the traditional banking system to purchase more properties so what are you talking about you're talking about the central model so the foundation is actually acting as a central model to leverage assets to buy infrastructure that it then leases in a decentralized way because if it gives a leasehold to the projects they are autonomous over 80 years so basically you are combining something that the world understands which is let's put the assets together in a central way and let's uh, let's give them and so this is a, a very concrete solution and you can do that and the question is if you look at Eco villages, co working spaces, hacker communities, they're all over the world. La now we need to figure out how we aggregate them, perhaps federate them, perhaps purchase them in a way that you can scale these ideas that you're proposing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I do think I do think we are s in a stage before. I think first let's look at this niche market that we are looking into and let's prove that it works. Let's prove that we can collaborate with each other, that we can purchase all those properties in that sense. Let's create a model that actually works and then we think about how we can scale that, you know. I think we are very early to but definitely there is a lot of potential but blockchain itself is not for in terms of like O ownership is also quite complicated legally, so I'll wait a bit. So let's figure out in other systems and maybe just translate them into blockchain once the time is comes, you know? I would think more from sell, that perspective. Sell, sell. Always be closing in the sale. That's what you think? <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> just explain yourself. I would be very curious about your mind. Okay. How I feel about uh, co-living is that we have an opportunity to sustain rental prices, right? So you have New York, which for me as a musician would be absolutely unobtainable with the money that I make. And then you have a place like Bali, or I don't, I don't know, I've never been to Bali. It might be cheap, right? So you have a global market. Maybe their costs are lower there than they were in New York. And maybe I could live in a system where we all compensate for each other's losses and gains. And I don't want to sell, I want to share. And I've never stood in front of an audience in such a way. <laughs> <laughs> 
there's always a first time. <laughs> However, I have done so. Thank you and good night. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, it's, I just want to add it, uh, um, but maybe it is because, uh, in general, it's not only legal problem, it's social problems. The, the reason we have that problem is everybody wants to live in the West Village. And everybody wants to have this nice apartment, and there's only a finite supply. And I really like uh, what Diana, I think is her name, uh, Diana. Uh, is, is nobody really wants to move on the countryside yet because it's, it's just the whole, again, culture hasn't catched up with it yet. It's, yeah. it's a romantic thought, but making it actually actionable to say, I spend 11 months of my life on the countryside, people don't want that. There is this huge urbanization in India, in China, in all those places. Mm. So while there might be a offering in the future to say how can we distribute humanity more evenly, right now, culturally, it's just so thought after to go to an urban, interesting yeah. core. So the question is more how can you change that? And then it becomes a question of what kind of tools do you use to actually make this change possible? But it's the tool comes secondary. It's, yeah. it's the underlying uh, structures yeah. mm -hmm. that need to be changed first. Yeah. Very good. Should we take that as a last Make the countryside quote? great again. So say it again. Make the countryside great again. Yes, yeah. I mean, this would be great. <laughs> actually, I would, I would love to combine it, actually. I have also not figured out how. There's actually a couple of people doing that. There's a, one of my uh, favorite members club concepts that's floating around at the moment is... Um, I forgot her name, Paula. Uh, I don't know what her last name is, but the project is called The After Party and is for mostly artists in, uh, uh, so in, in some far, far away future, maybe, um, between 50 and 70, um, who want to have a communal living space. And they're doing exactly this. So they, I think they open in Austin pretty soon. Yeah. And it's a very urban clubhouse, but then the residential part is outside of the city. Okay. So, yeah, that sounds good. Let's so maybe do we should maybe I, I, I wish for that also in Berlin then so please guys work on that or we work on that um, so I think um, if there are no other questions I will close the round and would thank again thanks for this amazing discussion thank you actually for this contribution <laughs>